Autoimmune disease has been on the rise for the past many decades, since the early 1940s, approximately 1943. We have this trend of an increase upward in autoimmune diseases. Now we see some correlations with that that I want to draw your attention to that have relationship to yeast overgrowth. And the two biggest are antibiotic use and carbohydrates. Remember, most antibiotics came into use in the early 1940s, and what we know about carbohydrates as well, cereals and other grain-based products became the primary and predominant staples of the U.S. diet. We know that wheat comprises about 50% of total calories, and that that's just wheat. That doesn't include things like corn or rice or other grains. So we know these two trends Cor correlate with the increase in autoimmune disease. And how can we make sense of that? That's what I want you to understand. Now, before we, we dive into that, let's talk about a few of these autoimmune diseases, just in case you're not familiar with that term. Maybe you've been given one of these diagnoses and your doctor never mentioned to you that these are actually autoimmune conditions. So what are they? Hypothyroid. And there is a, a, another term for that called Hashi Moto's disease. Now there's a hyperthyroid autoimmune condition called Graves, and, um, and so you've got hyper and hypothyroidism. Rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis, also psoriatic, there's a psoriatic arthritis um, that's autoimmune. There's disease like eczema and celiac disease, which is also autoimmune, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, We've got autoimmune hepatitis, which is liver dysfunction. Osteoporosis, this is a big one. Most of you have been told that osteoporosis is a deficiency of calcium uh, and minerals, but in reality, there's an entire new chapter in research called osteoimmunology. And this is the study of autoimmunity as a primary driving force behind bone loss. And then we have mental disorders, diseases like schizophrenia and bipolar disease and attention deficit hyperactivity disorders and Asperger's and autism, a lot of mental disorders that are also autoimmune in nature. And then we have many, many more beyond that, but these are some of the more common examples. There's actually uh, approximately about 140 different forms of autoimmunity. So again, we're talking about how candida, how yeast can drive this process. So now... Let's talk about some other reasons why autoimmune disease is on the rise. We've got gluten, as I mentioned before, 50% of the calories in the U.S. today are from wheat, but gluten is on the rise, gluten consumption itself. And if you have followed my work for any length of time or read my book, No Grain, No Pain, um, you're already very well aware of this uh, association or this linkage between gluten and autoimmunity. But we also have environmental chemical exposures, food additives and food chemicals, increased use of pharmaceuticals, things like antibiotics and steroids uh, and anti-inflammatories, and then environmental mold exposure. Now, this, is not, this slide is not designed to give you a comprehensive overview of all the potential causes of autoimmune disease. However, these are some of the more common ones. If you'd like a much more in-depth class on autoimmunity, check out my master class on autoimmunity. It's a multi-part series. We can put a link below this video in the description for you on that. But let's look at candida now. Let's go back to the topic of the day, which is candida. Now, candida is a driving force for autoimmune disease. Let's look at what we, what we would call classic symptoms of candida overgrowth. So ladies, vaginal yeast overgrowth, where there's a white vaginal discharge that occurs. Then there's also oral thrush, and toenail fungus, and let's pull up a couple of images here. You can see this is a classic example of toenail fungus. And, this, and so you can see the yellow discoloration, okay, and the growth and the abnormal contouring of the nails. This is yeast underlaying that toenail, creating that. You can also see in the fingernails, this is classic fungal in the fingernails. You can see this little pattern of white underneath the nail line right there. This is all yeast. And so you can see that same pattern here. You can see that same pattern here. So again, these are examples of yeast overgrowth that are manifesting in the nail beds of an individual. And so then we also have 
Oral thrush. This is a severe, severe case of oral thrush. Um, but you can see this is the, the tongue. And so you can see the pulling of yeast here and here and here, right? And the white discoloration on the tip. Most of the time, oral thrush manifests more like this white discoloration. This is such a severe immunosuppressed case. You can see the mucus and the yeast pulling actually in the folds of the tongue, but it's typically, it doesn't manifest this poorly. It more so looks like what you see right here, these little white specks and dots on the tongue there. So again, those are what we would consider to be classic symptoms of yeast overgrowth. And then you have what we would call hidden symptoms. And, you know, I want you to kind of take mental note of these symptoms because we're going to talk about a concept here in just a minute is where this is going to be very important. So we've got heartburn, fatigue, brain fog, intestinal bloating. So if you, uh, if you eat a meal in your stomach, you know, the classic beer belly, that's what we're talking about here. Constipation, joint pain, very common, sleep disturbance, women, uh, when you wake up multiple times throughout the course of the night, hormone imbalances, including things like hot flashes as well as dizziness and loss of balance. So if you find yourself a little wobbly or wobbly and unsteady on your feet, that's classic yeast overgrowth symptom. Let's talk about what causes yeast overgrowth or candida, if you will, because we're talking about candida as the primary driving species of yeast. But there are several different driving forces here. One would be alcohol consumption. Alcohol changes the microbiome. There's now evidence where the alcohol consumption manipulates or changes the different types of bacteria that thrive in a healthy microbiome, making it more easy or um, making it more readily available for that candida to overgrow. I think it's important to also say that everyone's GI tract Everyone's GI tract has candida. So this is a what we would call a normal part of our mycoflora. Myco refers to mold. Uh, but everybody has some small amounts of candida growing inside of their GI tract. And so it, it, it's important to understand that candida in and of itself is not necessarily evil. It's just that when you do these things... Here, when you embark upon these different triggers, what happens is that candida grows exponentially and you get an overgrowth. So I think it's important that we use that term overgrowth to delineate you know, the difference between normal amounts of candida versus height, heightened amounts that can create or contribute to autoimmune disease. So alcohol is a primary trigger. As I mentioned earlier, excessive Carbohydrates are a major trigger. Why? Because carbs feed yeast. Very simply put, if you've ever gone to, um, to a class on winemaking, what do they do? They take grape sugar and they take a special type of yeast. And what, are they, what, is that ha what happens there? The yeast eats the grape sugar. You produce wine as a byproduct. And so this is, you know, this is why we have to be cautious. You know, we already have alcohol consumption being, playing a role in this, but then we have, again, a diet that's excessive carbohydrates going to lead to the feeding of that yeast in an overgrowth. Then there are medications, and there are numerous medications that can contribute to yeast overgrowth. Um, some of them include things like antibiotics and steroids and immune-suppressing drugs and chemotherapeutic agents um, and antacid medications. And we also have mold exposure environment. And so this is environmental. So if you're being exposed, if you have mold in your house or mold at work, understand that environmental mold exposure, if it's high enough, causes an immune suppression. And that immune suppression um, makes it more available, makes it, makes it, Let's just say it creates a situation in your gut and in your body where this candida is no longer being controlled or checked, kept in balance by your immune system. So that immune suppression will allow this yeast to overgrow. Now, mold also changes 
the microbiome. It also suppresses certain types of bacteria that are actually preventative against a candida overgrowth. So we've got a couple of different mechanisms at work here with mold exposure. And then there's also malnutrition, vitamin and mineral deficiencies. Remember the nutrients are the tools that your immune system uses to run itself. And so malnutrition in the form of nutritional deficiencies can dramatically increase the risk for developing a yeast or candida overgrowth. Now let's look at you know, some research on this. So interesting that this paper was published in 1966. So this is not new information. And some people would say, well, it's not, it's not new enough, but, but I wanna just point out the statement here. The patients on antibiotic, that patients on antibiotics experience proliferation of candida albicans in the alimentary canal is no longer a point for dispute. And that's the phrase I want you to just let that sink in. What, what we're saying is, we knew this in 1966. There's no longer dispute. The, the research is very clear that taking antibiotics increases candida albicans overgrowth in the alimentary tract, which is you know the alimentary tract from your mouth to your anus. So antibiotics increase candida growth. If we look at candida in, in and of itself, let's talk, let's just a few definitional things here. Candidiasis, which is what we would call a yeast overgrowth or a candida overgrowth, is an opportunistic infection. Opportunistic, again, we all have candida in us, but when circumstances are right, candida will take advantage or take opportunity of those circumstances, and it will, and then an overgrowth can be created. Again, this list of things is what creates that opportunity for candida. So alcohol, excessive carbs, medications, mold exposure, and malnutrition, those scenarios create the opportunity for candida to overgrow, okay? Candida albicans is present in healthy persons, meaning again, we all have some, colonizing the mouth, the esophagus, the GI mucosa. Candida albicans can cause mucosal candidiasis in these areas where they are usually present in immunocompromised hosts. In patients who have leukemia, lymphoma, because of the consumption of, again, here's your medicines, corticosteroids, this things like um, prednisone. If you've been on prednisone or you're taking prednisone, uh, that's a type of corticosteroid. Or cytotoxic drugs, okay, why? Because these types of medications compromise immunity. So they lead to compromisation of the immune system's ability to control the overgrowth of candida. So you get candidal infection when you have immune suppressing medications. We also see here antibiotic usage is commonly associated with candidiasis, commonly. How many of you have been on an antibiotic? How many of you have been on multiple antibiotics? Now it's crazy is, you know, again, I'm gonna show you here in a minute, but go back to the symptoms that we talked about earlier. How many of you who've been on an antibiotic and developed any of these symptoms, sleep disturbance, hormone imbalance, dizziness, bloating, constipation, joint pain, heartburn, fatigue, brain fog, et cetera. Those are the symptoms of yeast overgrowth. Now, doctors prescribe antibiotics in today's day and age um, like candy. They just hand it out like candy without, without cause for concern that this could be a potential outcome. But again, you can see here, look at the statement. Antibiotic usage is commonly, not uncommonly, not rare, commonly associated with candidiasis. Now, again, how many of you have taken antibiotics, developed those symptoms, and then your doctor came back and said, well, let's test you for candida. Um, it's a very rare thing that doctors test for because it's commonly dismissed unless you have those super blatant symptoms that we discussed earlier. So again, that's the oral thrush or the toenail fungus. So again, if you don't have this, and you don't have this, most of the times, doctors are gonna dismiss candida and they're not gonna test for it. But you can have candida growing in your GI tract, and this is especially true of people that start to develop inflammatory issues in their guts. Most GI doctors are not doing stool cultures where they're measuring for things like candida or other forms of yeast that are pathological or that can create problems. So it's important that you understand this information.
You see here, cancer cytotoxic chemotherapy may result in fungemia caused by candida albicans. That's, that's where it translocates out of your gut. Okay, when we say fungemia, emia means blood. This is where the yeast make it into your blood. They translocate, they break through, they cause leaky gut, right? And they penetrate through the gut barrier into the bloodstream. That's what fungemia means. So this is fungal translocation through compromised mucosal barriers. In this case, the compromised mucosal barrier would be the gut. Now you can have compromised mucosal barriers in the sinus cavities. You can have compromised mucosal barriers as well vaginally, uh, and you can have comp compromised mucosal barrier in the lungs. So there's other places this can happen, but the most common place is in that GI tract. You see down here, vaginal colonization increases in patients that have diabetes and in pregnancy and in women who use oral contraceptives. Let's, let's pause just a minute and talk about that. Let's talk about diabetes. Why diabetes? Why do we see an increase in vaginal and yeast overgrowth in women who have diabetes? What, is, what happens in diabetes we got increase in blood sugar. What does candida and yeast eat? As we mentioned earlier, they eat sugar. Okay, and so candida loves to eat blood sugar. If you've got extra blood sugar, candida is going to eat that blood sugar. A side effect of that is going to be to generate alcohol. Um, we'll talk about that in a moment, is where people actually start making their own alcohol. And this is true of diabetics. It's also true of, of other people who, who have um, kind of prediabetes. But again, candida grows from glucose. It's its favorite fuel choice, if you will. So people that have their blood is a Petri dish, right? Diabetics, their blood is a Petri dish for fungal overgrowth. And so if you don't get that blood sugar under control, you let this candida grow out of control. What about pregnancy? Why does it occur during pregnancy? Because during pregnancy, there's a hormone that pregnant women make called prolactin. And it's got multiple different functions, but one of the things that prolactin does is it reduces the immune response. Why does it reduce the immune response? Because during pregnancy, we don't, you know, the body's so smart, it doesn't want the, the, the woman's immune system to go after the growing fetus. And so there's a, there's a mild immuno re repression during pregnancy that occurs. This is also one of the reasons why after pregnancy, once a woman gives birth, there's this, there's this period of time shortly after pregnancy where there's this increased incidence of the development of autoimmune disease because the nine months of pregnancy, there's been immunosuppression. And then right after that immunosuppression goes away. And now what we have is we, is we have a, an immune system that's a lot stronger. And so again, during pregnancy, when that immune response is being somewhat suppressed, we have an increased risk for this to grow out of control, that candida to grow out of control. And then we have oral contraceptives. Oral contraceptives, one of the biggest reasons that oral contraceptives contribute to yeast overgrowth has to do with the fact that these types of medications cause magnesium, vitamin B2, vitamin B3, vitamin B6 deficiencies. As I mentioned earlier, malnutrition is one of the reasons that we get immunocompromised as well. And so when you cause malnutrition through the use of an oral contraceptive over time you get again a reduced immune response and an inability or reduced capacity to handle candida so it can overgrow you can see here as well so back to this etiology page you can see other predispos predisposing factors of candidiasis include and there's a list of different medical conditions here like tuberculosis, myxedema, or hypoparathyroidism, Addison's. But this is what I would have highlighted here. Nutritional deficiencies. And in parentheses, and it's not limited to these three, but this is just what they're reporting in this. Vitamin A, vitamin B6, as well as iron deficiency. 
And so this is just another reason why we see uh, more commonly we see women who have menstrual cycles where they're losing iron once a month, a lot of blood loss, right? There's this time frame where women are more susceptible during their menstrual cycle, during menstruation, that they uh, have yeast overgrowth. We also know that smoking, because of the immune suppression that occurs, poorly maintained dentures uh, in the elderly, but really poorly maintained oral hygiene. It doesn't just have to be dentures, but poorly maintained hygiene. There are a number of candida species that can grow in the mouth with, with bad hygiene. And then, of course, there are a number of other things, IV tubes, catheters, heart valves, um, old age. I would say I disagree with this. It's not aging that causes the increased risk. It's accumulation in bad behaviors and damage over time, right, that oftentimes get blamed on aging. And then we have infants whose immune systems aren't fully developed as well as women during pregnancy, as we mentioned before. And then there's a condition called xerostomia, which is dry mouth, um, which can be a predisposition to developing candida, oral candida. And this has to do with the fact that there are antifungal proteins made in saliva. So um, there's one called histat uh, histatin and another one called calprotectin made in the saliva that actually have uh, the presence to neutralize fungus or yeast uh, or candida. So uh, many, many, many um, patients struggle with an autoimmune condition called Sjogren's. And um, Sjogren's, again, is a, is a situation where the saliva glands are being attacked in autoimmune fashion. And so there's xerostomia or dry mouth that develops as a result of that autoimmune disease. So there's an interplay between that autoimmune disease increasing the risk for fungal infections as a result of salivary reduction. 